Her slides on her own screen, but just every time she pushes, tell um, Shannon to advance the slides. Daniel, just for your reference, if you yeah. click participants at the bottom and it pops up on the right of your screen, you'll be able to see who is yep. listening. So we, Jim is here and Cindy. Oh, I can see us. You can see us now, Dr. Tapa. Your video has frozen again. So our suggestion was that um, Shannon run the slides so that the bandwidth is less on your end. Would that be acceptable? And then you can follow your own slides and say, next slide, please. And now you're muted again. <laughs> so many things at one time. <laughs> well, we have a few minutes here. Mm -hmm. Oh, still muted. I mean, I'm going to do a, a share screen here. Unmuted, yeah. Oh. yeah. Perfect. Um, okay, now, Shannon, do you want to share your slides and show Dr. Tapa how it will look? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Namaste, Darsad. Oh, great. Very nice. Okay, so Dr. Tapa, just so you know, we keep losing everyone. <laughs> um, let us know if you are speaking. Okay. It looks like she dropped off. Okay, so She's let's back. stop sharing Shannon. And then when after um, Daniel does his introduction, we can share again. And hopefully we don't lose Dr. Tapa. Every time you come back, I don't know if she can hear me, but we'll have to remind her to unmute because it keeps adding a mute back in. So. Daniel, if you want to start, you know, um, yes, being in charge. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say how happy I am to be here with the World Future Generations family. One of my most longstanding colleagues, Dr. Rita Tapa, um, who has just recently been appointed the Carl Taylor Professor, endowed professorship of equity and empowerment public health. Um, it's a real honor for future generations to have Dr. Tapa as one of our endowed professors. Um, I first had the privilege of getting to know her in 1969, when as a, at the young age of 24, I was appointed to work under Dr. Tapa in Nepal, in Nepal's Maternal and Child Health and Family Planning Program. And at that time, Dr. Tapa was already a distinguished leader in international health. Um, Dr. Tapa had represented Nepal in 1978 at the World International Conference on Primary Health Care in Amata. Dr. Tapa is today one of the few people uh, still alive, who signed the Amata Declaration, which was the pivotal document, the pivotal moment to that established the field of primary health care. And since the, her, the 1970s until today, she has been leading a, the development of primary health care in Nepal. And very modest in her presentations. But the consequence of her work that she started caused Nepal to be the only country in South Asia to achieve its MDG goals in health 
India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, none of these achieved the health MDGs, only Nepal. And the reason they achieved the health MDGs is because Dr. Tapa understood one thing very important, which is that a health system already existed in Nepal. And that was mothers in their homes. All these other countries were trying to introduce scientific health systems based in clinics. But Dr. Tapa understood that the health system of Nepal had been lasting for, for centuries. And it was in everybody's homes. And so what she did, set up a program to create volunteer women health groups working together, women supporting each other. And she introduced education and management systems to these village women's groups. And today there are over 50,000 of these groups across Nepal, working in their communities across the country. And it was extraordinary that through the civil disturbances that have happened in Nepal for now 70 years, this program continues and it grows. And the person who designed and led that was Dr. Vita Tapi. And it is a real honor for future generations to have this leader with us. And she achieved global leadership status because after the great successes in Nepal, she became the director for the World Health Organization's health programs in, across Asia. So she moved from the Nepal leadership to global leadership, and she'd established that position earlier in 1978. And so Future Generations is deeply honored and very gratified to have Dr. Tapa back as a colleague, because I say she began as my boss. And you can imagine how difficult I must have been to supervise when I was 24 years old. And this is the woman who was my supervisor back then. And I will like to note that before she had me to supervise, she had Chris Kluett's wife, Suzanne. And Chris Rita is on this call. And I'm sure Chris is thrilled to see you again. And we have also on the call here some other dear friends that you've worked with. Uh, Sal Werner is joining us from Aspen, Colorado. Uh, Mike Stranahan, who's worked with you. Um, Laura Otoboli, um, who is the leader of future donations in Peru, earlier held the Carl Taylor professorship that you now hold. Laura, like you, was a student of my father's. And so there is, with I won't go on and on because there's so much that can be said, but you don't see all these other names that are sitting here on my screen as a presenter, but there are many of your old friends, future generations colleagues, and we're all so honored to have you here. I believe also um, Bill Grant is on this call. Bill Grant is the son of Jim Grant, Rita. Bill's on our board of trustees. And you, of course, worked with Jim Grant at the Amata conference back in 1978. So there's lots of loops and circles coming back here. So with that, Dr. Taba, it is a great pleasure to welcome you as the Carl Taylor Professorship and introduce you to the world family of future generations. And I will sign, turn off my video to maximize the screen and turn it over to you, Shannon, to lead the slides and Dr. Taba to talk. But thank you so much. Dr. Tapa, you're still muted, sorry. Can you start again after you unmute? I think your stable connection is okay. very good. Can you start from the very beginning? <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Daniel I. Taylor.
for your kind words about me. Um, and also, I'd like to uh, pay respect to Kelly Fleming, chief academic uh, officer, and all the uh, esteemed faculty members of FGU, Shannon and uh, Surendra Gurun. Thank you all for giving me um, this platform. Uh, forgive me if I sound uh, sleepy and yawning, uh, that is uh, because it's my bedtime. But I would like to um, be alert as much as possible. First of all, I would like to begin by offering my gratitude to the entire academic family of Future Generation University for honoring me with the endowed Carl Taylor Community Health Professorship at this distinguished university. I'd also like to take this opportunity to offer my deep gratitude to the legendary Professor Carl Taylor for empowering me with the cardinal public health mantras that have guided me throughout my career. My presentation today is all about, just about it. Next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, can, we, can we increase this slide? Uh, is it possible to make it a, because I, anyway, this presentation is about my direct lived experience of applying Professor Carl Taylor's three cardinal public health mantras and turning the mission impossible into a huge public health feat in Nepal. Next, please. Contextually, as you know, Nepal's modernization began only in 1951 with the ushering in of the first wave of democracy. Until then, Nepal was harshly ruled for 104 years under an oligarchy regime. I grew up in Kathmandu at that time when girls' formal education was illegal. Child marriage used to be taken as a Hindu religious act and polygamy as men's innate right. Maternal mortality used to be normalized as natural as being a woman. Marriage was the only career option to women, thanks to my unusually liberal father, that I was able to escape such a fate. Next, please. Data from that period on health situation is scarce. Professor Carl Taylor's medical report of 19. 51, which is likely the first ever health report on Nepal, has portrayed a, a very grim health situation. Malaria, Kalajar, filariasis, entharai, and diseases traveling from the feces to mouth, uh, like amoebiasis, intestinal parasite, typhoid, cholera, etc., were prevalent across the country. Patients were hungry, half-clothed, illiterate, backward citizens who faced premature death from preventable diseases. There was no system of collecting vital statistics, no health officers, and no attempt to meet for disease prevention outside Kathmandu. Next, please. And this, I have brought this picture from Professor Carl Taylor's report of Pokhara, you know, the man is standing there is the supposed to be medical officer and the thatched hut is the dispensary at that time. Next, please. A considered national effort to develop public health began uh, with the country's first fiber plan 57, 1962, with the Malaria Eradication Project. My career trajectory began against this backdrop in 1962, with my first job as a medical officer at the country's first maternity hospital, Kathmandu. I observed that most women came to the hospital with repeated pregnancies, 
in the very last stages with life-threatening complication. At one point, I bluntly asked a few of them, why do you want to be pregnant all the time? They retorted, we are not like you. After marriage, we have to do what our husband wants. Next, please. These interactions, you know, I learned from these interactions about women's helplessness in their own reproductive choice and issue of gender disempowerment. This left me with a huge personal challenge. How could I empower women to overcome the syndrome of repeated unwanted pregnancies? Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. That is why I came to uh, Johns Hopkins to learn a uh, public health approach to maternal child health, health. And this is when I met Professor Carl Taylor and uh, learned the, the basics, public health approach to maternal child health. Upon my return, the government had adopted um, family planning policy, mainly with the objective was to balance between population growth and economic, uh, economic growth. So I was very happy to join, um, to be the head of both family planning and maternal child health project. We had started virtually at a zero level with only three full-time staff. At that time, I had the first WHO advisor to Nepal, Dr. Ida Van Dyke, a public health nurse, Ms. Thamsung, and myself. Expect, except for my aspiration for better health, women and children, I didn't know much about public health approach to MCS. Next, please. That's when I came to Johns Hopkins. Upon my return from Johns Hopkins, I headed Nepal's family planning and maternal child health, which were run under a semi-autonomous board. I welcomed family planning and incorporated family planning as an inseparable component of maternal child health services, a way to empowering women in their own reproductive choice. Together, they took up synergistically as a priority family planning MCS project. Next, please. Next, please. I also had my own gender battles to fight. The donors preferred to run family planning as a vertical project as in the neighboring countries. I was insistent for keeping family planning and MCS together as an integrated package delivered from one door. A male representative of major donor agency not only opposed my stance on integrated approach to family planning MCS, he provoked the predominantly male staff in my office not to work under a woman while lobbying for my transfer from the project. The idea of separation did not sit well with our field evidence, which showed integrated MCS family planning services to be more synergistic and holistic. While family planning offered MCS and infrastructure, MCS developed rapport for family planning among MCS clients, winning their trust and providing an excellent contact point for family planning motivation. Next, please. But this guy not only opposed my stance on integrated family planning MCS, I think I have already repeated that. However, thanks to the political leadership of that time, the government stood firmly by the side of the integrated approach. I continued as the chief of the project and he finished his assignment in Nepal and left. I was not surprised to hear a few years later that he was expelled from work for his anti-women behavior. Next, please. But then I soon realized that starting an MCS family planning project in a country that had no prior policy experience program and health infrastructure was like a mission impossible. I faced too many anomalies. First, there was no basic health infrastructure to start with. 
The second most serious anomaly was the severe lack of trained health human resources of any kind. Yet the prevalent health paradigm of the day required medical doctors for delivering MCS family planning services, regardless of its nature. But medical doctors were rarest of the commodities. Thus, despite growing political pressure to fast track MCS family planning services, the project could not go beyond Kathmandu. Next. The gap between the limited supply of human resources and increasing demand for FPM services were huge and ever widening. The prevailing health paradigm was obviously failing MCS family planning needs. Unless some innovative solution was found, we could not deliver on the political aspiration of expanding family planning MCS services across the country. In a desperate response, we undertook a functional analysis study in the clinics in Kathmandu. Next, please. Our findings showed that many of the tasks undertaken by medical doctors did not actually require their presence. 80% of the diseases observed in the US were simple enough, could be tackled by paramedics if detected early. Diarrhea was the most prevalent followed by malnutrition and upper respiratory tract infection. However, serious life-threatening consequences like dehydration, koshirka, pneumonia, and health death could occur if they are not detected and treated early. Next, please. This is just a diagram to show what I spoke uh, right now. This is from the survey report, the study we had done. Next, please. Now comes the three mantras. Pressured by the political leaderships armed with our study findings, I spontaneously recalled the three mantras that we often heard from Professor Carl E. Taylor at Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health. Those were train mothers as the number one healthcare providers use homes and communities as the number one healthcare facility and regard behavior change as the number one medicine for true health. You know, these were, these were gold, uh, gold mantras for me at that time. Thus, we conceived the idea of creating an entirely new category of basic health worker, primarily consisting of local females to deliver specific services as trained for these we named as health aids. Next. Prior to government, I consulted with Dr. Ida Van Dyke, the WHO advisor, and she answered very succinctly. She said, well, health aids, such health aids were not in WHO policy, but as sovereign country, Nepal could decide if it was good for the country. So I went to the government, but it was not easy to convert our evidence-based idea into government policy. Our proposal of creating a new category of health workers or health aides met with hostility from both medical professionals as well as government bureaucrats, especially from the Ministry of Finance. The finance ministry official I met instantly rejected it, calling it an unsustainable idea arguing that Nepal was too poor to pay the salaries of hundreds of new health workers, even though external donors might temporarily fund it. Next, please. I was deeply disappointed, but did not give up. Tactically, I tried to boost his ego instead of arguing with him. I replied, what are you saying, sir? Everyone I meet believes you are the most brilliant economist in the country and you will soon make Nepal prosperous so that even a rural citizen can obtain basic health care. Flattery worked. He approved our proposal there and then. In 1967, the government finally approved our proposal to recruit and train 104 local health aides, mostly women. This was an important turn because that changed the world to the new public health paradigm, health paradigm. 
using community health worker for the first time for delivering basic primary health care. This shift actually occurred in Nepal a decade before the Almata Declaration. Next. However, our policy action had it to withstand another difficult test, the community ex acceptance. As we knew that the nursing school in Kathmandu was half empty, and given Nepali society's conservative outlook on gender, I was worried whether any woman even be allowed by their families to apply for training as health aides. Equally important issue that bothered me was even after training them, could they effectively deliver the services as trained? Next, next please. But soon by chance, one incident eased my worries. In 1968, I was in Elam district in East Nepal to open new family planning MCS clinics. Around midnight, a health assistant woke me up to show me a severely dehydrated toddler lying listlessly in her mother's lap. Initially, I panicked because I had nothing at hand to treat such a case, yet I had to do something as medical doctor. I improvised an oral version of a saline drip and instructed the mother to make medicine water by boiling about five tea glasses of water, which is about one liter, with a pinch of salt and a fistful of sugar, and to let it cool and then feed it to the child intermittently even while breastfeeding her. Next, please. Having done what I could, I prayed and went back to sleep but with the lingering fear that I might hear the mother's wailing at any time. Around five in the morning, when hesitantly I opened the door, I saw a miracle. The child was playing on her mother's lap. This proved to be a eureka moment, a moment of being showered with blessings, showing me the path for a scaling family planning MCS across the nation. It erased my doubt in my mind about it, any doubt about health aids. Next, please. This incident showed us the power of the three mantras of Professor Carl Taylor. Let me explain. A simple homemade medicine water, salt, sugar water, could save thousands of children's lives at home. Mothers, if trained and could prepare and administer such life-saving technology at home. And more importantly, people could also change their own behavior as this mother did by feeding her child medicine water, contrary to the folk norm of restricting water intake during diarrhea. Next, please. After this, there was no stopping us, Professor Daniel I. Taylor, dear friend of our late King Birendra, had joined me then, boosting our project to a new high. A detailed account of our work can be found in the Population Council Country Profile Report 72. But it was impact, particularly rewarding for us to find health aids willing even more eager to return to their communities after training, unlike most of the nurses and doctors. Next, please. So now we are able to reach the communities delivering a set of few safe, doable, and proven basic interventions like health education. This is where Daniel Taylor contributed a great deal, health education and communication. He even helped us to <coughs> put population education in the school curriculum and family plan about the homemade oral dehydration. I have described immunization, et cetera, you know, which were all, and lastly, you know, because new, malnutrition was a great problem. So we affordable introduced traditional gruel called Lito, which has since gone into commercial production as Sarbotam P2. And the same way the homemade oral dehydration has gone um, you know, commercially as Jeevan Jal. 
Next, please. My other major primary health care journey began in 1975. The government appointed me the chief of the Integrated Community Health Services Development. It's the Nepal's primary health care. This was a mega project born out of an imminent threat of resurgence of malaria, another example of major anomaly. By 1972, Nepal's malaria eradication project has reached targeted maintenance level, but with no basic health services to maintain such gains. As 50% of total health budget went to malaria annually, the government simply didn't have enough resources to develop basic health services. Next, please. This is when the government changes policy from a vertical project to an integrated approach, creating the integrated community health service development. My job required bringing the structures, functions, and operations of all the five particular projects under the single administrative umbrella of the Department of Health Services. Naturally, this entailed endless discussions and arguments with the five vertical projects who were united in their opposition to an integrated approach. Next, please. <clears throat> it was not an easy task but it gave me a, a gold opportunity to in institutionalize the primary health care by innovating female community health volunteers, linking the five vertical project services to the ward level where the people live, you know. <clears throat> we worked on a war footing, establishing a countrywide network of integrated district health system and integrated health posts, <clears throat> linking them with village health workers, mothers groups, and fam female community health volunteers. Finally, finally, we all agreed to rename all of these community-based health workers of five respective projects as village health workers, working under <clears throat> integrated health program under the Ministry of Health. Next, please. Here is an interesting story about how we engineered female community health volunteers. In 1978, we submitted a pilot testing of female community health volunteers, one e each ward of 1,000 to 2,000 population. But the proposal never received a reply so when I went to see this health secretary, he showered me with remarks like, I had thought you were an intelligent lady, but you are now proposing to create so many leaders at every ward. How many leaders needed in this small country? Next, please. I understood, I understood the, you know, the political meaning of this, so I apologized and withdrew my proposal. After consulting with our colleagues, we agreed to change the name of community health leaders to female community health volunteers, removing the term leader. A rose is a rose, whatever be the name. When I sent the proposal back with the change name, the secretary immediately approved the proposal. I would like to introduce the secretary to you. You may have seen in my first uh, slide, uh, Dr. Carl Taylor um, with him. The man in the hat is uh, Secretary of Health at that time, Chitra Badur Kesi, Mr. Chitra Badur Kesi. So this was the guy who was, I feel grateful for correcting my politically incorrect vocabulary of that time. After a pilot test, the female community health volunteers went nationwide with the support of USAID. Next, please. I was privileged to represent Nepal at the 1978 International Conference on Primary Healthcare, Almata. The deliberations were very reminiscent of what I was doing in Nepal. Dr. Hafton Malhar's call for a new 
health order, a just and lasting ways of bringing health to all, was moving. I felt immensely encouraged to see that Article 7 of the Almata Declaration resonated with our experiments in Nepal. The Nepal government endorsed and adopted the Almata Declaration. Accordingly, we continued to weave the principles of Almata Declaration into Nepal's primary healthcare system. Next, please. So what is the health mileage Nepal covered? We have all the existing evidences so a striking difference in health indicators from its benchmark in 1950s, 60s to date. A few examples, most importantly, the country met, as Professor Daniel Taylor already highlighted, that all the targets of Millennium Development Gold on child mortality, maternal mortality. Smallpox was eradicated in Nepal. Malaria was effectively controlled. Leprosy was eliminated at public health level. Nepal celebrated zero polio in 2014. Epidemic transmission HIV has halted. Next, please. These are the table I have just put for your information, 1950s, 60s to 21. As you notice that our 8 million people has grown now almost 30 million. Average life expectancy has risen from 27 or 28 years to more than 70. Literacy rate you know, has gone from 5% to more than almost 68%. So it goes on, you know, that, uh, and our uh, maternal mortality, more than 1800 has come down to eight, 186. And I will also like to point out here, total fertility rate, you know, it was six, now it is almost at the replacement level. And the contraceptive rate, user rate also has gone up. Next, please. Keeping in view that health outcomes, of in outcomes is the result of interplay of several related health and socio-political factors. I would summarize a few key primary healthcare-based policies, principles, strategy that have hugely contributed to today's healthier Nepal. Next, please. First, the innovative strategy of breaking away from the old public health paradigm to a new that trained and used community-based health workers. Training and mobilization of female community health volunteers has paid a huge health dividend. As put by a study, FCSB are saviors of women and children offering basic health services at the grassroots level. Another study concludes that FCSB have effectively contributed to maternal mortality reduction as the alternative pathways and strategy. In other words, it was the actualization of the three mantras of Professor Carl Taylor in real communities in real Nepal. Next, please. Second, Nepal's adoption of an integrated pyramid approach to primary health care. The integrated <clears throat> community health with a countrywide network of more than 50,000 ward level female community health volunteers and some 4,000 village health workers at community level with a proven set of interventions over a long period, thus bringing a striking and sustainable positive health outcomes. For example, you know, maternal mortality, it was very surprising to see that a maternal mortality rate and under five mortality continued to decline even through a decade long internal conflict because of community ownership of FCSVs. And also I may like to highlight uh, this uh, pyramid shape bit. As you see in the pyramid at the base, we see the countrywide network of integrated health centers, health posts providing services at population level. 
and the network of district super, supervisory channels because these uh, community health volunteers needed all the time supportive supervision. And at the top, all the Ministry of Health, all the specialized service program programs are at the top. Next, please. The third factor was the sustained political policy priority to the integrated package of primary health care. One study shows that it was 77 to 75% of government's total health expenditure for 2001 to 2009 went to primary health care. This was a critical factor. The integrated approach found more equitable access to primary health care with better user and provider satisfaction and greater sustainability in communities than those without it. Equally important, integrated approach to PSC was found cost-effective in terms of disability-adjusted healthy life, life years. Nepal's health outcomes over 50 years has been higher than its per capita health expenditure of dollar, US dollar 41. Next, please. In conclusion, <clears throat> the health mileage that Nepal has covered so far is no small feat. For a country marked by centuries of feudalism, poverty, illiteracy, discrimination, and virtual absence of health infrastructure, including decade-long internal conflict. It is a primary healthcare breakthrough, a solid foundation for realizing fundamental basic health rights for all as enshrined in Nepal's 2015 constitution. The credit for this striking success belongs to every member of Nepal's primary healthcare team, starting from Professor Carl Taylor, political leaderships up to the frontline female community health volunteers, including all the external development partners. Next, please. Special credit goes to women and men in communities for their collective ownership and action. As a member of public health team of the old kingdom of Nepal, we feel rewarded to greet the Federal Democratic Republic of Nepal with today's much healthier us. Next. Lastly, my thanks to the future generation university leaderships for giving me the opportunity of sharing my direct lived experience of applying the three mantras of late Professor Carl E. Taylor while developing Nepal's primary healthcare systems. Thank you. <clears throat> well, what a great joy, Rita. <laughs> uh, for me personally, uh, to be working with you on this continuing effort. Thank you very much for your Thank more than generous comments um, about future generations and, and, and about the contributions of my father, because the real leader here was yourself. And as you noted, the women of Nepal, the women of Nepal have been doing this for thousands of years. And now we are providing some resources so that they can do it better. Um, we do have a few more minutes. And I think all of us, there are um, more than 40, 44 that were, have been on this call. Uh, there's some people who would like to ask questions uh, Kelly, can you tell the folks who are coming into the webinar system how they post their questions to Dr. Tapa? Because what we have here on the screen are only those who give have the authorized um, thing or um, Paula. So can one of you break in, please, and advise those from the audience who want to ask questions how to do so? Great, Paula and I both at the same time. So there is a Q&A um, option at the bottom of your screen and that will post a question to everyone in the webinar. And um, Dr. Tapa should be able to see that. I don't see any questions at the moment listed there. So Dr. Taylor, if you have something right. that, that I did follow do. up you have. I, do. I think, um, I think the, the role here that uh, Rita gently alluded to uh, was yes. this, uh, was this international advisor who told Dr. Tapa she was wrong and then went lobbying all the staff, including to Dr. Tapa's husband, to try to get <laughs> Dr. Tapa fired because she was a woman. 
and therefore <laughs> incompetent to deal with healthcare. And I think that while this story is hilarious, and we all, <clears throat> some of us remember Ralph Tenhave, I'll mention his name, USAID employee, <laughs> who also was Chris, the, the advisor for Chris Kluett's wife, Suzanne, and Chris is on yeah. this call. No. The point that is important here is how do you deal with really stubborn men who are trying to tell what women what's right? So before we get other questions, how does the woman <laughs> deal with those problems? I, I, first of all, Daniel, I, I was supported. Of course, he was a, a male, you know, opposing, op opposing what we were doing. Uh, that is his belief. But there were a lot of good men around me, like you, also supporting me and, you know, what I was doing. And that gave me a lot of strength because the young man from um, <laughs> this guy from America is supporting me. This is this is good. And, you know, and then I had my faith with my staff because, you know, we're all it's a good team. You know, it's a good team. And I knew that uh, he will fall flat, you know. I knew that, so I didn't even bother to 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 undo anything or talk to anyone. Uh, you know, I mean that just uh, he did what he did. He he went, and I did what I did. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but uh, but you know, uh, actually, at the political level, at the political level, you know, at that time, you know, children were dying like um, like flies. You know, I mean uh, that was the very bad health situation. And on, on in that, you know, just to have a separate family planning project and go and tell that limit your children would not sit well, you know. And whereas maternal child at a lot of young parents came, a lot of young people came, young mother and young father came. And that was the platform for family planning. And that is the that is what the political people also realized. After all, they have they they you know they know their villages better than I I know, so so it didn't sit well with them also the political leadership. I knew that it would it will fall flat, so I didn't bother. Right, uh, Rita, we have one question here. For, they want to you to repeat the three mantras. You had them in a slide, but could you just repeat them so people could take notes? That's one of the questions that's coming from a guest. Yeah, what is the slide? Which is the slide? Well, just from your memory, can you repeat the three mantras? Just so people oh, can know. Oh, three mantras. Okay, okay. Right. Yeah, I will I will just show it to you. Can you see my slides? You know. Uh, well, we'll have Shannon put the slide up. I think it's easier. While Shannon's putting that slide up, um, yeah. uh, we have another question. Um, yeah. It comes from Rosie in Lynch. Me in the meantime, I can I can answer those three points. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. the, the first mantra was that uh, home is the best uh, place for health care, you know, home. And that's what uh, that's what I realized at that particular incident. And other thing was that the second point was that the mothers are the best health care providers. And this is also it manifested in my experience in Elam, you know, I saw it, you know, that was what happened. And the third one was behavior change is the number one uh, medicine for true health. And that's what uh, all these three mantras somehow, you know, appeared in, uh, in front of me in a real, real, real way, you know, real sense. And I, I actually, at that time, I feel so blessed, you know, I found the answer how to, how to scale. Okay, that's wonderful. Vita, let me get, turn to another question. It's a very interesting question, which is about <clears throat> naming. It's from Rosie Lynch. And she says, it is an interesting progression. First, you called them health aides, and mm -hmm. then you tried health leaders, then mm -hmm. you tried health volunteers. Are you mm -hmm. now happy after mm -hmm. all these years no. with the name, or would you like to put a new name if you, I, if you I, yes, give yeah. a new name? Yeah, okay, let me, let me clarify. Health aides, um, you know, are salaried, salaried health workers. They are selected from communities, 
trained, uh, trained for community health work, and they are part of the integrated health post at the at the at the village. Okay, they are uh, they are not volunteers. They are they are community health workers, salaried health, part of the health system. The female community health leaders. We wanted to we took file as leaders, but we changed into female community health volunteers for reason I already explained. So the, these are the volunteers. These are not paid workers. They are, they are, you know, they are so, they are so committed, you know, to serve their village. And we didn't pay them. You know, what we did, the minimum, what we did that these, these uh, the loss of their ways, of daily ways, because uh, we gave them a staggered way of training, you know, first training them a few things at a time and bring them back to the health post and see what they have done. And maybe we can give further training, you know, like that. It went on like that. So when whenever they came to a health post for one day, we paid them, uh, we reimbursed their um, wage. Uh, you know, the, it was minimum amount of rupees. So this is how it started. They were volunteers, and they remain volunteers, and they were very powerful as a, as 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 volunteers. They wouldn't listen to Dr. Rita Thapa, but they would listen to her in the community. So they were that powerful. So so you know, <laughs> they are they are very special type of cadre volunteers. That's very helpful, uh, Rita. The next question comes from mm -hmm. Luke. And what is, what are the greatest challenges today before Nepal's healthcare program? And what is the role of mothers today as if, in, in the challenges? The challenge is, you know, COVID, uh, COVID epidemic, the pandemic of COVID taught us suddenly the challenge. You know, it came out again vividly. You know, you know what happened that, you know, <clears throat> You know, as I told you that we changed from a kingdom to the Federal Republic, uh, Democratic Republic of Nepal, okay? So that uh, 2017, um, the new leadership, you know, at that time, the prime minister, they, they wanted to restructure the whole thing, restructure, you know, in, instead of building on what they have, instead of building, strengthening the structures we have, they wanted to dismantle everything and name it. So as a result, you know, this, uh, we, we had built all this system for so, so long. Uh, it, it is in a, in a bit of array right now, but I think I will show you, but what has survived female community health volunteers. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you see, the, even in COVID time, Prime Minister Oli, the only name he took uh, was female community health volunteers. We should train them, we should train them, you know, like that. So, so you know, uh, the challenge is that how to bring them back again in the changed context, in the changed context. It, Nepal is a bit, uh, it's not the same Nepal as I used to know. You know, I started to work. Now I see a change in Nepal. People speak their mind out in the in the field. So the challenge is how to how to you know take lessons from all what we had done, which which had given us good results in the past, and build uh, those kind of things in the in the change context into the change. You know, everybody talks about hospital these days, you know, at the political level. The, the hospital, you know, the, that our, our approach is that let minimum people go to the hospital. We need hospitals, okay? We need hospitals. I'm not against hospitals. But our job is to, as, as a, a minimum number of people should actually go to the hospital. I don't want to go to hospitals. You see? So, so when, when I need, of course, I, I need to go. But then they're talking only about the hospitals, hospitals, you know, and that's, but I'm sure that, you know, but uh, I must say one thing very positive that I have seen, uh, again, I'm working, um, on the more on adolescent, uh, you know, empowering the adolescents, uh, boys and girls. So I have seen that uh, at the at the 
at the municipality level, you know, there is a lot of energy, there is a lot of hope, and there is a lot of uh, um, can-do kind of, uh, you know, aspirations, energy. And this is, uh, this is what makes me happy. And this is where we should, we should, we should focus. Thank you. Um, we have a, a couple more questions here, and the time is good. Uh, from uh, Chido, who's in Zimbabwe, uh, Rita. Mm -hmm. Chido mm -hmm. is an alumna of our master's degree. She's also a um, member of parliament, national parliament in Zimbabwe, and leader of the women's caucus in the parliament. Yeah. <laughs> so she asks, um, she likes the realization of the women's reproductive rights and potential, but men typically think that when you're recognizing women, something mm -hmm. is being taken away from the men. <laughs> that in, in process of recognizing women, you're taking something from the men. So mm -hmm. how do you deal with this issue of men feeling that they're losing? <laughs> you know, I actually, <clears throat> I actually, you know, uh, I can speak from my own experience, recent experience, of course, before, you know, men and women, women uh, department, uh, this and that, all that, that was different. Although in Nepal, we started vasectomy, you remember? Uh, <laughs> Daniel? <laughs> Vasectomy, I, I, because because <clears throat> vasectomy was simpler and cheaper, and we could do it even with the uh, you know mobile cams to the taking doctors to the helicopters and get it done. So it was very popular. But anyway, I'm coming to the point. You know, the boys and uh, men are feeling there. So the, I, I think uh, I think uh, the right way. I'm not. I don't know what is right or wrong, but then. I find my recent approach when I go to the schools, I talk to both boys and girls. We have both boys and girls together because uh, we are talking about gender discrimination. We are talking about sexual violence, you know, uh, just talking just to women or girls only, I don't think it can solve the problem. So bring the uh, boys also together because uh, there are, you know, maybe the, uh, at least I can speak for Nepal, the patriarchal, the values, you know, uh, have given the boys uh, the kind of uh, license, you know, I mean, the cultural license that uh, teasing girls is okay, it's a manly, but it is not. So, so once they come into the class, they exchange, uh, there is a more understanding, you know, and a more, uh, because boys also are children are go you know they are also they are not bad they are not demons and they are just human beings you know and the girls also so i think we need more interactions uh, uh, at least i have seen in the adolescents you know this uh, this is working very well uh, i i in 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 two of my program that uh, that uh, that i i'm running now you know well, uh, your new work with adolescents is very inspiring. We have time for one last question, and it comes from Dr. Laura Tobley in Peru, who held the Carl Taylor professorship uh, before you, Rita. But okay. uh, Laura asks the important question, um, which is the relationship with the health professionals. Did you find, as you were advancing the role of women as health professionals, well, they weren't professionals except when they were paid. But as you were advancing the role of women, did you find resistance from the medical establishment of the doctors and the ministry as the, that there's somehow or other you were challenging and undermining health services rather than supporting it? Well, uh, you know, speaking personally from my own experience, you know, I, I, Except you know, like uh, like you know, we we you know ten a you know that's the that's the time when I felt you know that's the only time I felt directly opposing me you know as a as a as a woman, but as I went in a hierarchy, but I think uh, uh, I must say one thing: the women had to work very hard to prove, like like me you know. I had to, I had to, you know, when I took that integrated primary healthcare program, the five verticals projects were fighting. And I don't think it was anybody's, uh, you know, cup of tea actually at that time. 
So the, the you know the director general called me and asked me to head this program. In the beginning, I thought I cannot do it. You know, I I just maybe he wants me to he wants me to fail. You know, something like that. I got a bit worried because I saw them the fight very strong men were you know the fighting against integration concept. But then uh, I don't think he he no. I, to answer your question, I personally, except for working, you know, I I realized that um, as a woman, I had to work uh, much harder to prove what I'm doing. Um, except that uh, personally, I didn't feel any kind of uh, you know. I got um, I'm thankful I got opportunities. And it was uh, testing hard, and uh, the, the the nurses. Yes, I felt uh, that the nurses were uh, being being uh, you know being uh, kind of bit discriminated and all that. But as a medical doctor, I I I didn't feel like that. Well, uh, Rita, uh, we are at full time. Um, so for this presentation, um, I just would like to say to um, everybody, thank you for coming. Um, I, there's one a very, two, a very important a piece of background about Dr. Tapa that I have not shared, um, <laughs> which is she began her professional career in health as the national champion in badminton, women's champ, badminton champion for the country of Nepal. And now, and at this point in her life, she is the national women's golf champion. So in addition to a very illustrious medical uh, career, she is also an elite sportswoman of the country of Nepal. You know that, and, yeah. And, and with that, Rita, I think from all of us folks, you know how to give you the reactions in the reaction chamber, please, a, a round of applause and a great Thank deep welcome to Dr. Vita Top of the Carl Taylor Endowed Professorship of Health. Thank you so Thank much. You so Thank much. you so much. Thank you so much. You made, you inspired me a lot. Thank you. Thank you. So because of your inspiration, I could talk during my sleeping time right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I really enjoy talking to you, Daniel. So nice to see you back again. I so, thank you for everything. Uh, thank you. Thank so you I so much, Vita. And thank you, everybody who's joined. I must, I must thank Shannon also for her help. Thank you, Shannon. Okay, bye. You're um, goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Helpful. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>